Speak Out Socialists, a podcast produced by Speak Out Now. We are a revolutionary socialist group. Our website is speakoutsocialist.org. You can find us on Facebook at Speak Out Now or on Instagram and Twitter at Rev Socialists. These are the reports from the week of July 22nd. Reopen the schools, our health versus profits. As the U.S. COVID-19 death count approaches 145,000 people, Betsy DeVos, the Federal Secretary of Education, has embarked on a media blitz. Over and over, she has pounded home the same message, quote, the rule should be that kids go back to school this fall. They've been missing months of learning, unquote. DeVos's response exposes the real guidelines of this society. The profits of the 1% are the main priority. To jumpstart their economy, they hope to send millions of people back to work, but that requires a system of childcare for the children of many of those workers. It's not learning they're concerned with. It's the profits produced by the parents of those children. And that means schools must be reopened this fall, no matter how ruthlessly the virus is ravaging our communities. To make it as plain as possible, Vice President Pence declared, quote, We don't want CDC guidance to be a reason why people don't reopen their schools, unquote. Instead, they prefer to play Russian roulette with the lives of children and school staff. The science is crystal clear. Schools can't be reopened until the community spread of the virus is stopped. And the only way to stop community spread is with widespread testing and contact tracing. The politicians have had five months to build these programs, but they twiddled their thumbs while COVID-19 liquefied the lungs of more than 142,000 people. A recent report estimated that K-12 schools need between $158 to $245 billion to implement the CDC's guidelines for reopening schools. Yet when Congress passed the first coronavirus relief bill, it allocated just $13.5 billion for public education. Meanwhile, the U.S. government spent $738 billion on the military this year, and some major cities sent up to half their budgets on the police. As schools have been starved of funding and the lines at the food banks have exploded, the billionaires have seen their wealth increase by $565 billion during the first three months of the pandemic. Priorities of this system couldn't be clearer. Although the politicians in both parties have proved incapable of responding to the virus, they're more than prepared to use the crisis to continue privatizing public education. Trump has threatened to withhold federal funding from schools that reopen using distance learning while DeVos has argued for increased school choice, a fancy term for increasing public funding for corporate-controlled charter schools and private schools. The attempt to turn children and school staff into human guinea pigs brings to mind the words of the poet Langston Hughes, who reminds us that the old and rich will live on a while, as always, eating blood and gold, letting kids die. The burden of death and illness during the pandemic has been distributed unevenly across our society. Latinos, African Americans, and Native Americans, who make up a disproportionate share of the poor and working class, have contracted COVID and perished at much higher rates. The situation is also reflected in our education system. The burden of overcrowded and underfunded schools is just another measure of the brutal racist nature of the system we live in. The protest movement that burst forward following the public execution of George Floyd shows our possibilities. We can't look to the politicians to save us. We can only look to ourselves. 
This is a fight for the health and safety of students, families, teachers, and staff against the interests of the 1%. Only one abortion provider in the whole state. In West Virginia, there's only one abortion care clinic to serve the population of the entire state. In normal times, this clinic stays solidly booked for abortion procedures and follow-up care every month. Local, as well as traveling doctors, provide the medical services for patients. West Virginia government officials used the pandemic to further attack abortion rights. In April, they suspended all elective medical procedures in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and included abortions, as if these could be delayed. Because these abortions could not be delayed and were sometimes emergencies, the categorization as elective left this clinic and all of its patients in a terrible bind. Patients that had appointments in April had to be told to go to another state to have the procedure, placing yet another obstacle in their way. The West Virginia government lifted the suspension in May, and for this clinic, it's been a game of catch-up ever since, having to book abortion care appointments four weeks out. Right now, there are six states in the U.S. which, like West Virginia, only have one abortion care provider for the entire state. There are obvious flaws in this system we live in, and the pandemic has highlighted just how dangerous these flaws can be to our health and livelihoods. Whether it's a lack of PPE or depending on the sole abortion care provider in the entire state, it's clear that the way society is organized does not serve us. Keeping women poor, stressed, and under the sway of a morality that attacks our choices helps only the rich, who can afford to fly wherever to have an abortion and never fear that they or their children will do without. Removing racist team names is long overdue. What's next? For nearly 90 years, Native Americans have protested that a racist slur was the name and mascot of the Washington, D.C. NFL team. Activists referred to the team's name as the R-word, comparing it to the N-word. For years, team owner Dan Snyder has adamantly refused to change the name. In 2013, he said, quote, We'll never change the name. It's that simple. Never. You can use caps, unquote. But on July 13th, the team announced it was retiring its racist name and logo. Many have explained Snyder's sudden reversal as caving into pressure after several of the team's main corporate sponsors, including FedEx, PepsiCo, and Nike, finally came out in favor of a name change. But the real reason for the change is not some newfound sensitivity of the corporate sponsors. Like Snyder, they too ignored the continuous protests of indigenous activists for years. The explosion of nationwide protests after the brutal murder of George Floyd is what changed things. When for weeks, hundreds of thousands of people, especially black youth, poured into the streets across the country to oppose the systemic racism of this society, Many corporations and institutions tried to win approval by removing entrenched symbols of racism. NASCAR finally banned the Confederate flag, while the state of Mississippi finally voted to remove it from its state flag. Quaker Oats Company, owned by PepsiCo, eliminated the racist brands Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben. Schools and other institutions named after racist historical figures are undergoing new name changes, and many statues commemorating racists continue to be taken down. These changes are long overdue. They are significant because they were unimaginable just a short time ago. However, it's important to remember that name changes alone will not transform society deeply or in any lasting way. For corporations and the government, the main purpose of these symbolic reforms is to convince people that the system is still capable of addressing people's grievances. If and when those illusions are shattered, movements can attack the deeper systemic racism and injustice of this society, the economic exploitation and marginalization that is the bedrock of this system of profits. Let's hope this elimination of symbols is only the first step in the fight against the deep racism of capitalist society. PG&E, When Criminals Rule. 
We're only halfway through the year and 2020 is already expected to break global temperature records. This isn't big news though. We've been hearing about record-breaking temperatures for the past decade. The message is clear. Global warming is intensifying, and the longer we go without meaningful change, the more dire the consequences will be for life on this planet. In the meantime, PG&E recently pled guilty on 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter in the devastating Paradise wildfire in 2018, and the company was charged for a $4 million fine with no criminal probation or jail time for any of those on the board of directors. In the past month, there have been a number of fires in the Bay Area that have caused a great deal of smoke in the air. The thick smoke, along with the threat of displacement, injury, or death, have become yet another danger for regular people just trying to live their lives on top of the uncertainty of living through this pandemic. If public safety is left up to PG&E and other profit-making corporations, we can expect more of the same. They will profit while destroying the environment and our lives and get off with a slap on the wrist. We can only depend on ourselves, not the courts. At the height of the recent Black Lives Matter protests, the Supreme Court ruled that doctors performing abortions did not have to have admitting rights at a nearby hospital, thereby making it easier for women to exercise their right to an abortion. Now, as the protests quiet down, we have seen the exact opposite. The court issued a new ruling allowing companies to opt out of having their health care plans cover for contraceptives on the basis of religious and moral grounds. The measure is one more way that bosses cut costs to increase their profits, and the result is a direct attack, specifically on female workers who will be left to themselves to figure out how to get contraceptives. Without access to them, women have to pay out of pocket, In the past, before the mandatory coverage for contraceptives was made into law, that meant that collectively, women spent $1.4 billion more in health care than men per year. And now, having the extra cost in the middle of a pandemic and economic crisis is an even heavier burden on women. It's hard to say for certain that these Supreme Court rulings are tied to the activity of the Black Lives Matter movement. But we did see that the recent protests got killer cops fired and racist monuments taken down. The court rulings do bring up some major questions. Why is access to health care tied to our jobs? And why should the bosses decide who gets access to contraceptives when so many women depend on these methods to secure their choice, freedom, and independence? The answer is not in depending on the courts. The only way to have our voices heard is through linking people's issues and connecting struggles. The giant protests following George Floyd's murder by cops show the possibilities that await us when we fight back. July 19, 1979, Nicaragua, the Sandinista Revolution. July 19th is the anniversary in Nicaragua of the 1979 revolution that overthrew the brutal dictator Anastasio Samosa de Valle, ending a vicious family dynasty of terror in the name of corporate profits, personal enrichment, and the defense of U.S. imperialism in the region. He was overthrown by a revolution led by the members of the Sandinista National Liberation Front, FSLN, known as the Sandinistas, a group of revolutionaries mostly from intellectual circles and middle-class backgrounds with wide popular support among peasants and the working population of the cities. Somoza's dictatorship traced its roots to the occupation of Nicaragua by the U.S. Marine Corps. The Marines occupied Nicaragua from 1912 to 1933, with one of its main goals being to ensure that no country other than the U.S. would build a canal in Nicaragua. When President Franklin D. Roosevelt ended the occupation, he had another plan for U.S. control in the region. It was Anastasio Somoza Garcia. Roosevelt famously said of Somoza, quote, he's a son of a bitch, but he's ours, unquote. The son of a coffee plantation owner, educated in the U.S., 
and later general in the Nicaraguan military. Somoza overthrew President Juan Bautista Sacasa in a military coup that had U.S. support and soon became president. He led one of the most corrupt, self-serving, and vicious dictatorships in the history of the continent. One of his first goals was to completely eliminate the rebels who fought alongside Augusto Sanino, a leader of peasants and workers who had formed a guerrilla army fighting to expel the U.S. Marines in the northern countryside. When U.S. troops left the country in 1933, Sandino agreed to put down his weapons in return for amnesty and some land for his fighters. Somoza double-crossed him and had him captured and assassinated in 1936 during their peace talks. The revolutionaries who rose to fight Somoza's son in the 1960s and took power in 1979 took their name from Augusto Sandino, calling themselves the Sandinistas. Ironically, President Roosevelt named the new policy of withdrawal from direct intervention and control in Latin America the Good Neighbor Policy. This title really requires a strong dose of cynicism. Rather than controlling countries such as Haiti, Nicaragua, and Cuba with U.S. Marines on foreign ground, this policy proposed that the U.S. use proxy dictators wielding terror and assassination to maintain the rule of profits. Somoza was their man in Nicaragua. When Somoza, the father, was assassinated in 1956, his eldest son, Luis Somoza de Valle, acceded to power and continued his father's despicable legacy, later to be followed by the younger son, Anastasio Somoza de Valle. In 1972, Nicaragua was hit with a devastating earthquake, and Managua, the capital, was obliterated. Money to aid the Nicaraguans poured in from around the world, and Somoza appropriated a large part of the funds to enrich himself. This was the last straw. The population turned fully against the younger Somoza and gave its support to the FSLN in the fight to oust him. The more the rebels grew in strength, the more brutal was Somoza's repression. The greater the repression, the more people's disgust with his regime grew. Finally, the U.S. government ceased to back Somoza, and he and his entourage fled Managua. On June 19, 1979, the FSLN entered Managua in a spectacular festival atmosphere. Today, in Nicaragua, this day is a national holiday, celebrating the end of a brutal regime, which was supported by a foreign power of extraordinary cynicism that masks its horror in a flag it claims represents liberty for all. While the Sandinistas claimed to be creating a socialist society, what they had in mind was really something more modest. They wanted an independent Nicaragua to take its, pa to take its place among the many states in the global economic system. They wanted to take some of the profits that went to U.S. corporations and use them to develop the economy and reduce poverty. The defeat of Somoza's regime occurred only because the population had had enough and united to oust this vicious tool of U.S. imperialism. The Sandinistas have not solved the problems of Nicaragua, which are rooted in capitalism, nor have they even begun to build socialism. Only an international revolution would accomplish this, with the mass participation and leadership of the entire working class not just a minority of idealistic freedom fighters taking over society on our behalf. But with the end of the Somoza regime, some significant freedoms were won. The new government finally invested in educating its population, reducing illiteracy from 53% to 12% in a few years. And once again, it was proven that the U.S.-backed dictatorships can be defeated, a lesson that the U.S. government would prefer we forget. Trump sends federal agents in unmarked vans to arrest protesters. In Portland, Oregon, Trump has taken advantage of ongoing demonstrations against police brutality to send in officers from the Department of Homeland Security. These officers have been violently arresting protesters, picking them up on the streets in unmarked vans. As one protester said, quote, see guys in camo, four or five of them pop out, open the door, and it was just like, oh shit, 
I don't know who you are or what you want with us, unquote. Trump's DHS secretary, Chad Wolf, has explained that his office had chosen to send DHS officers, claiming that Portland was under siege by a violent mob, an Antifa, terrorists, and other fantastic claims. No, Portland has seen Black Lives Matter demonstrations just like almost everywhere else, led by young people and full of anger and hope for change. Portland has also seen confrontations between protesters and far-right racists. These racists are the same kind of people Trump flirts with by hinting that he supports them. This use of federal agents in Portland is a play by Trump to look strong for his supporters by attacking protesters, doing it over the heads of Democratic politicians like Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler and Governor Kate Brown. These politicians have all condemned Trump and rightly pointed out that this is an election year stunt. However, in making this move, Trump shows just how easily constitutional rules and rights can be pushed aside if politicians and the wealthy interests they represent feel that it serves their needs. We are reminded of the fact that though the government is completely unprepared to handle a pandemic to save lives, when it comes to terrorizing the population, the government is ready and able at the drop of a hat. Who to blame for California's new lockdown? On Monday, July 13th, with coronavirus cases in California rising steeply, Governor Gavin Newsom reintroduced some restrictions on the reopening of the economy. Some are calling this Lockdown 2.0, or California's second shutdown, though the restrictions are milder than the first time around. The new restrictions mandate that bars, churches, gyms, hair salons, and tattoo parlors must close again, while restaurants must once again stop offering indoor dining. This is frustrating news to many Californians. Some in the media and on social media are blaming those who went out to parties, bars, and beaches as soon as the first lockdown started getting rolled back. Some are also blaming those who attended the protests that followed the murder of George Floyd, calling the protesters hypocrites for triggering a spike in cases in the name of protesting police violence. So who should we blame for the rising cases and the resulting lockdown 2.0 in California? Do we blame Black Lives Matter protesters? No. It's been well documented that a considerable majority of protesters in the wake of George Floyd's murder have worn masks, that these protests took place outdoors where transmission is less likely, that protest organizers diligently distributed masks to the public, and as a result, the surge in protest events did not trigger a surge in coronavirus cases. Was it worth the risk? June and July saw the largest mobilization of people this country has ever seen, demanding justice for black lives and an end to police brutality. As a result, politicians and administrators around the country are backpedaling as fast as they can to placate the protesters. Police chiefs have resigned, police officers have been charged, sweeping reforms have been promised. As long as the capitalist system remains intact, the racist violence of the police and the courts will never go away. But the mass protests we've seen were an invaluable step toward realizing our own power, and it was crucial in this moment for us to stand up and not let the brutal murder of George Floyd go by without our outrage being heard. It should also come as no surprise that the majority of people who took to the streets in the name of denouncing violence and affirming life did so with enough care so as not to trigger a surge in coronavirus cases and cause more deaths. Do we blame people going to bars and parties? Or what about small business owners? Undoubtedly, when the first California lockdown started getting rolled back, too many people started going out to crowded indoor areas again or gathering in large groups without masks. As businesses reopened, many were careful, but certainly not enough business owners or customers took social distancing as seriously as they should have. But is it reasonable to expect everyone to behave responsibly with a clear understanding of the risks they're taking when mainstream media is full of fake news about the pandemic being a hoax, when the Trump administration 
keep spewing misinformation over the airwaves, and when every level of government displays a lack of leadership and contradictory policies without a coherent plan? What serious attempts have been made to systematically educate the public on the urgency of this threat and exactly what precautions are necessary to handle it? And as the attempts to educate the public have been made, how can they compete with the ocean of misinformation? If not them, then who is to blame? Back in March, Governor Gavin Newsom was widely applauded for responding to the pandemic with the nation's first statewide lockdown. In fact, Newsom's response to the virus was far from perfect. The response came too late, with inadequate testing, while Newsom tried to put the burden of the state's new budget problems resulting from the lockdown on the backs of workers and the poor, cutting social services and education, and leaving farm workers especially vulnerable. But at least compared to other governors, Newsom responded quickly with restrictions on the economy and public gatherings. California was spared the worst horrors of the pandemic, as witnessed in New York in March and April. But after all these months, we've still never had a serious rollout of testing and contact tracing, which experts have been saying for months is essential to deal with this virus. Meanwhile, big business interests have been eager to get people back to work again. By mid-May, Newsom was caving to corporate pressure and relaxing restrictions against the advice of health experts. And despite the fact that we were still in the midst of the first wave. By June, even bars and gyms were open again, and cases were still rising every day. So why should we be surprised by the new surge? Many of us have lost our jobs and incomes in the pandemic, but the capitalist system gives us horrible choices. Risk death by going to work or face being unable to feed our families, pay the rent, and get medical care. In the capitalist system we live under, profit comes above all else, including human life. The corporations and the politicians who serve them cannot help but push back against common sense and scientific expertise. They can't help but roll back the lockdown too soon and too quickly, out of hunger to restore profits. Even now, under pressure from charter school profiteers, administrators in Orange County have decided to reopen schools in the fall without masks or social distancing. As the cases continue to surge, Liberals will blame conservatives, conservatives will blame liberals, people will blame protesters and small business owners and workers and customers. In other words, we will keep blaming each other until we recognize that this crisis was created by the profit-hungry 1%. We have to take responsibility for our safety, and that means recognizing the threat of this virus, responding responsibly, and holding each other accountable we can and must educate each other and ourselves and organize to protect ourselves. But we can do this without falling into the traps of division, which the corporate elite and corporate media like to set for us. International students still face risks. On July 10th, Trump's administration announced that international students had the option of either taking in-person classes or losing their student visa and, as a result, being deported to their home countries. The decision was rescinded, but the situation for international students is still dire. International students who are enrolling at their colleges for the first time, or who would start taking classes at an American university this fall, will still have to face the choice to take at least one in-person class or not get a visa. Regardless of whether this decision will remain the same until the first day of classes in the fall, the fact is that such attacks on international students are not new. In fact, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, was known for creating fake universities to attract students with the promise of receiving an F-1 visa and then deporting them. And recently, there has been an attempt by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service to tighten the penalty for minor infractions like dropping a course, resulting in the student losing their visa or even being prevented from getting into the U.S. for years. 
The way that these decisions have been implemented during a global pandemic shows what people's lives are worth to the system that Trump represents. It is clear that a government that works for the interests of big business will use any means necessary to reopen the economy, while at the same time using anti-immigration hysteria and xenophobia to create divisions among people, all of whom are oppressed and exploited by the system one way or another. COVID-19 is not a hoax. At Methodist Hospital in San Antonio, Texas, a 30-year-old man who attended a so-called COVID party died after being infected with the virus. According to the hospital's chief medical officer, Dr. Jane Appleby, just before the man died, he told his nurse, quote, I think I made a mistake. I thought this was a hoax, but it's not, unquote. Dr. Appleby also said that he told his nurse that he thought he was invincible from the virus because he was young and healthy. It's no mystery why there are many people in this country who believe exactly what this young man believed. For months, politicians and many media spokespeople across the country have repeatedly called the virus a hoax and have said young, healthy people have nothing to worry about. Many have discouraged the importance of wearing masks, downplayed the importance of social distancing, and rushed to open up businesses when it was not safe to do so. There is no reason that a person should have to face death in order to take this virus seriously. There should be systematic public education about the virus. Doctors and scientists who understand how this virus works should be all over the media and given far more airtime than those who are willing to lie about the virus and dismiss it in order to keep the economy open and the profits flowing to corporations and banks. It is a complete failure at every level of government that this hasn't been happening. Speak Out Now is a revolutionary socialist organization. Our website is speakoutsocialists.org. You can find us on Facebook at Speak Out Now or on Instagram and Twitter at Rev Socialists. We want to thank Boots Riley and The Coup for letting us use their song Get Up featuring Dead Prez. Thanks for listening. <laughs>